sitting in my new shed, Lisa has asked me what it is I'm just making here. And this is the very first job I'm going to do in it. And what I'm making is a garden measuring stick. Six foot long. For the first two feet, you divide, put a saw cut every three inches. And then every six inches from then on. Because our numbers tend to wear out, we drill one hole at one foot, two hole at two foot, three hole at three foot, four hole at four foot, and I'm sure most of my viewers, not all, but most, will have enough intelligence to work that it's five and five, work out that it's five and five foot, yeah, and six and six foot. Is absolutely pissing with rain today but there's something about the light on a rainy day that I really like so we'll have a little wander around and then I'll show you how we got from there to here this side path we mostly finished the other one this is a new one um, I've been working quite hard on this. There was a lot of soil to dig out, mounded up the bed so that it's higher than the path. So the cut of the path is lower than the beds. I like that because it gives you something on either side to work. And as you become an old fart, you need to work from somewhere level uh, onto somewhere higher. It just raises up the, the garden for you a little bit. I've stuck in some of the old hostas. Um, so they're looking quite good. This path has got to have the ballast put in um, and then the pea gravel on the top like the other one. The light is beautiful at the moment. The camassias are out. Um, the little red, the red pygmy. You can see the rain on it. It just, I just find it adds something. It freshens everything up and makes it look really nice the tulips are sort of going over the cornus alternifolia um argentia alternifolia is is just starting to break into leaf that's nice and we've had wind for days and days and uh that's been quite difficult so restricts filming um this little woody area, I planted a few things in here that we had knocking about and uh, it'll get finished out oh, next winter, next spring. Um, but for now, it's okay. There are some lupins that we put in earlier. You never leave a rake like that. You stand on it and it clocks your side the ear roll. I did that. Wanker. That's oh, really annoying. Yeah, um, the pond. That's my next major project. We're going to be starting on that quite soon. I say we. Uh, it's me, actually. Um, the little bit of veg garden I did. The spuds are coming up. The camassias along the side. There is just That's where all the gravel was piled up. So... I didn't know what to do with it, so I just turned it over and stuck a few potatoes, onions, broad beans in. Where else are we? 
That there is an Acer Brilliantissimum. It's like a poncy sycamore. Uh, it's lovely and salmon pink in the spring and shite the rest of the year, to be honest. I do not know what this hosta is. We've had it years. And I'm not a massive hosta fan, but they, uh, I like some of them. But some of them, they all begin to start to look the same, but this one is very distinctive in its colouring. And it has, it's just a lovely hosta. I really like it. So if there's any uh, like hosta geeks out there and they know what that is, I would love to know. It's very, very nice. The leaves are about nine inches by six inches, I would say. Yeah, so there's the palm of my hand, or a digit. Mind you, some digits are longer than others, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> I hope nobody sees anything smutty in there. Well, so yeah, we've got this bit here to finish off. Uh, I think Lisa's going to order some gravel. The maple that we um, trimmed out a year or two back is looking really nice. You get under it and it's just lovely. It's just straight viridi dissectum viridis. Um, yeah, Acer palmatum dissectum viridis. It's just a posh way of saying it's a, it's a finely cut green maple. Oh, what else have we got? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Now this, this is uh, my own uh, Rogersia. It has lovely white flowers. It was just a selected seedling. It's just a seedling we found um, at Eggleston. We call it hockey. I don't know why. It's probably my old nickname, really. Uh, right, carry on. There's the clematis, one of the ones we put in. It's going to be getting up soon once it's finished flowering. I don't know what colour it is because I've forgotten which one it is. Trilliums are still out. Lovely pink ones that come out after the, the reds. That is a very nice magenta trillium. These are just compared to the um, very popular dark red ones. Yeah, you can see the two there. Um, there's sort of magenta and here's a sort of like uh, a really dark one. I don't know what's happened to them primulas there, primula shibaldii. They've just sort of come up, look really nice and then they just toppled over it. They could have suffered a bit in drought. It's been very dry as well. This is uh, some Dactylorhiza. I've done a video on dividing them but that's for another day when we do more specific stuff. So there we are. I don't know what to do up here. Can't make up my mind. In the winter this bed's very shady, in the summer it gets a fair bit of sun. Uh, the tulips are going over at the pier. He's looking lovely. These these are little troughs I made. They're, they're looking really stony now. Some are looking more like stone than others, but yeah, that's an age thing. There, a lot of these plants could be planted out. Some of those little lilac there. They're two different ones. That one and that one. They look the bloody same to me. There's another one over there, it looks the bloody same too. You know, I, don't, you know, I don't want three of them in the garden, I'll send two of them over at the Thomas. And those are the roses that we uh, budded a year or two back with uh, Randy Mandy. Um, yeah, that's it, some pit sporums to go out. There you go. So now, a little bit on there to here. You catch me doing a little bit of 
digging this piece of ground here we had all the gravel laid out on and it's quite compacted so for this year we're just going to uh, clean it up with a few spuds in it uh, it's not really the spuds that clear it or clean it it's the actual fact that you have to dig it over deeply you earth them up and then you dig the spuds so the ground gets turned over two or three times it's uh Strangely enough, for some people, they hate digging. When I first started out of college, I used to dig for six weeks a year. Six weeks, we had about an acre of vegetable garden. And from about mid to late October, first frosts, right through to Christmas, it would dig. What we're doing here is just... Uh, single digging I haven't got time I would it's a double dig I would probably do it in the autumn I would have preferred to do this in the autumn but it wasn't possible because we had stuff on the ground but I find um, I find it quite a therapeutic if you don't go mad at it there's something just natural for me about seeing a piece of steel cut through the earth and turn the ground over I love to see that look of fresh earth turned over preferably in the autumn when you can sit and watch the winter do its magic and break down the particles and you hit it come the spring and you hit it with a fork and it just breaks up beautifully this will be all right for spuds. Whether you do it with a spade or with a plow, there's just something ancient, historical, and wonderful about it. I just find it fascinating. Anyway, that's my task at the moment. So let's go down and visit somebody. Uh, who I suspect would rather have a pineapple wedged up his backside than do any digging. We'll go and see Matthew. Here we are. Here's Matthew. Um, this is what we covered. We covered this plot up. This is our seedbed area. We covered it up with this black polythene and made these frames. Um, so we could get the seed, the uh, weeds to germinate and put some heat in it. And you can see them all there. That's mostly sunflower get the seeds to germinate early and then um, we can get rid of them before we put the seed beds seeds in because otherwise we've got lots and lots of weeds that we need to pull up but it's taking a bit of a battering in the storm but I think it's okay it seems to have worked oh, look at that. mostly I don't know what the little things are it's quite eerie actually most of them are sunflowers uh, not sunflowers dandelions yeah, thistles not dandelions, thistles. Yeah, so we'll see how that works. We've pulled off half of the cover um, and there's lots of weeds which have germinated. So there's mostly thistles and I'll go up here, there's lots up here. I don't know, it's probably clover or that willow weed. There's a lot of clover in this bed. There you go. Lots of little weeds. Now if you weren't to pull them up, they would just go green. Now they've got the light on them. It's like crest, but I don't think it is. Yeah, it's worked better than we thought it had. There's something that's actually green over there. That's had no light and is still green. Is it? Oh. That is a beach. From here, it looks like a baby beach. Yeah. I don't think it's worked as well on that side because that side was not facing the sun. But anyway, this is, we'll get rid of these weeds. Old fashioned it might be, but this just seems to work. I think it's just blow torching off all the young weeds. Hopefully, we won't spend hours having to weed them this year worth a try. Old fashioned but old fashioned used to work.
Well, they're all coming out now. Hi Laura. Just getting some plants to pot up. Yeah, they're definitely they're overdue. Look at the weeds in there. These are, are top grafted top dissectums. dissectums. I think they're one of the last ones my dad did. The last few he did. Yeah. So we're just, just pulling these out so they can be potted. They're in three litres at the moment and they're going into 7.5. Now we've got everything. We pot everything, yeah, that can be cut down in a couple of years, that will look really amazing. Yeah, we used to throw away all of the oddly oh, shaped and deformed ones. Um, now we keep everything because you can guarantee if you just chuck them in a corner with the intention of throwing them away. Neglect them, um, Yeah, neglect them. Um, you can guarantee some customer will come along and see them and they'll say, oh, I've just got just a spot for one that shape because so, it goes over that way goes over that way come close so do this, i really want to <laughs> quickly is it worth before i break all these off this is a dissector oh it's a See? double whammy is it worth keeping it as a dissector um yes i would say okay. so yeah so what we need to do is break all of these sheets off yeah they're a bit big just to twist i think those ones all right so they, they come away, as long as it comes away yeah. clean so that's it stops them growing back so much. Yeah, that's a top, <coughs> excuse me, a top grafted one. You'll see in a minute. Growing the seedling stem on for it's a couple perfect, of years. It doesn't chase down the stem, but. Yeah. It's not overly neat doing it that way, but I know it does It stops work them growing better. back. It is neat, look. Once they all grow. There you go. That's what you want. That's the dissectum. So the dissectum is more important than the understock. That is the understock. Yeah. Although it looks It's pretty. still as lovely but it's just we mm. can um obviously charge more for the dissectums Got all the mod cons here wheelbarrow and our very ultra modern bespoke potting bench Come round this side, madam. Oh, yes, boss. Now, we'll bash them out the pot, take off all the weeds. Hi, Maggie. Which is quite She's hard bored. In these big gloves. Easy Easy. Just break all the new shoots off. Because they're so. You get all these knobbly bits, but in time, they will be fine. When they're young like that, we do actually leave the leaves on the stem because it draws the sap and much. moisture up to the graft younger than but that. at that point now they're this age they need to come off yes that's it okay oh and then i'll show you sorry then they go from a three so this is a three liter they would have been in a one liter last year all those the Not white nice ones are actually the weeds roots, yeah that's a weed. That's Asa root. Um, yeah, these go into a 7.5 litre, which is around here. Yeah, you don't want to jump too quickly the sizes because Aces don't like to be potted into too large a pot. They struggle to root round during the see, summer. Not actually much and then of a, they won't. Um, much of a gap. Yeah, we always ideal. We always recommend not potting them up. Not over potting them. Yeah, because they struggle to root round during the spring and summer, and then you get problems with them having root rot in the winter. That's so. it. Yeah, okay, I better get on. Okay. There's ravens up there. Yeah. Lurking. Oh, yeah. Is he? Is he gone? Yeah. No. They're circling. I can see yeah. There they are. Yeah. They're courting. I don't want to sound sexist, but um, Lisa and I have been sat in the kitchen watching this bird box. A bird box there, and there's been a pair of tits. We thought maybe they were nesting or feeding, but uh, we think it's just exploratory. They're having a little look in and out. Uh, I got to thinking that you can guarantee the male bird will have gone in there come back out and said that's fine and she'll have gone so we'll go and look for some others 
And Neela said, no, no, it's all right, we'll make a nest in there. She said, no, no, let's go and look at others. And they'll spend the next week going around looking at other nest boxes. And then they'll come back to the first fucker. It's, it's, it's a female thing. So there we are, there's, a, there's another bird box. I made 19 of these bird boxes and put them around. There's one in that laburnum. There's some up in those pines. There's some robin and wren boxes hidden around in conifers and hollies. There is quite a lot up in these other trees. The good thing is from, um, from the shed, from the workshop now, in here we can actually get a good view and what I'm looking forward to is being able to sit in here. Oh, yeah, you probably haven't seen this. So I've got my lathe set up. We're doing some wood turning and uh, vice and things. And I made this bench. It's not going anywhere. It's built like a brick shit house. I'm really pleased about that. Have to get the tools all sorted out. But what I was saying was, uh, you see up there, I can see I can see nearly all of the bird boxes up there, especially with a small pair of binoculars. Yeah. And over there, and over to the summer house. So you can get a good view from this, uh, from this workshop. I'm starting to get some of the tools hung up. And uh, yeah, there's, the pond I've started on, I really hate it. I, I mean, it's like an, a nightmare for me. I, I really do not want to do it, but I do want to have a lovely pond there. So again, so that I can see the wildlife, hear the wildlife. As I said to you, I keep saying, you have to have a garden for me that's alive and you can listen to it and it's full of life and sound. The job of my, my job, or any gardener's job, is to give the garden a voice. Give it a voice and you give it a life. That's very philosophical, that. I feel like I should do a really good knob joke now, but I can't think of one offhand. So it's coming on. Oh yeah, it's just a, I will get all the tools put out eventually. Um, and this is where we will be doing a lot of the um, propagation and uh, tips and advice and things and go through all the things I've learned over the years. I'm going to make a little potting bench here so that you can join me and we can just talk about plants, gardens and probably general smut as well because, uh, you know, I have this feeling that a lot of my viewers, I, they have a, a distinct base element to them. I, I, you know, Nothing wrong in that. Uh, earlier on, I picked this up and told you that it was a viburnum, which it is. And it's uh, massively fragrant. It's actually viburnum burke woodyi. And um, it's prone to aphid attack. So you need to keep an eye on it for any leaf distortion and then put some spray on it, something like rose clear, something like that. Um, but it is a fantastic thing. Even if it gets here and it ruins the flower for early on in the year, it does grow through it, but it is prone to, to this leaf distortion. The aphid gets right into the growing point. This is flowering very early actually, but it is, it is a lovely thing and the scent is unbelievable. It is every bit as good as the Daphne. And if you know the Daphnes, you'll know that they are quite dramatic as well. Yeah. Viburnum burkwoodii. And this is a, another little flower that's coming into a, this is um, a ranunculus montanus. Look at, look at it, look, look how the flower is so beautiful. It's green in the center. It's a little creeping ranunculus. Uh, ranunculus montanus, uh, it's a double form. It's beautiful. You know, we're not going to grow too many doubles in this garden because they're not really useless. They're 
no use whatsoever for pollinating insects. But that's not to say we can't, you know, everything in moderation, enjoy a bit of this and that. We'll come back and look at the Lathyrus furnace. Again, and there's a few of them around and they're Lisa's seedlings and she's taken them from some rarer coloured ones and I think they're going to look quite nice. Yeah, there's a, a whole range of bits and pieces, daffodils coming. Yeah, snake's head fritillaries. I think there's even a, a white one over there somewhere I can see. Yeah, looks like it's going to be a white one. They are a lovely plant. This is one of my favourite birds, the long-tailed tit. Sometimes they call it bird on a stick. It is a lovely bird. They tend to come, this, is, this one's on its own. They tend to come in groups of like 10 or 20 or 30. But maybe that's more in the winter, but they are delightful creatures. Really fun to watch. Okay, a couple of little things of note here. Little wood anemones, anemone sylvestris. This is the one I was telling you about earlier in the year called Robinsoniana. Compare it to the uh, lovely wood anemones that I filmed probably in the sequence before this, if, if uh, my uh, continuity is right. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely little blue colour and it, it's quite expensive to buy. But if you persist with it, it will creep up on you and suddenly you'll have a nice little clump of it. It's a beautiful thing. Now I'm starting to edge up the banjo around the pier. <laughs> we can see here, I've defined, I haven't done it all yet, I'm just working on it, but I had this arbor here and the idea was to uh, have a bit of a garden. So I've made a scree between the lawn um, and the arbor itself. It's just really a little dwarf conifer, some little gear white primulas, a couple of saxifrages. That creeping bastard, oh, I don't know what that is. Ro 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 yeah, oh. I'll, I'll caption it for you. And snow in summer. I'll have to caption that as well. Cerastium. Oh. You see, it's an age thing. I'm really forgetting the names of things I've known all my life. There's something else there as well. Um, and just one or two little things, just poked in to see if they do. And it creates a nice defining edge, sort of between the grass and the arbor itself. I quite like um, alpines because they give you so much interest in, in a little space. So looking at it from a distance, it's, uh, yeah, I think that's quite, quite nice. It'll be a little scree area in the relatively busy and wild garden eventually. But controlled wilderness. It just provides some interest earlier in the year as well. So I'm happy with that. May put a couple of little sedums in there or something. And this is where I'm working at the moment, just going to define the border edge. You can just see in there where I've slot in the, um, the edging. So I need to move all the turf to the north side of it. Here we'll have to reseed later. Um, I've just planted some uh, nice dodecathion I had, uh, sedalsia. And um, the lovely little cushion spurge, uh, Euphorbia um, polychroma. That's a lovely thing. That there just coming up is an aconite, but it's a climbing one. I think it's Helmsleyana or Helmsleyanum. Yeah, let's see how that does. Uh, yeah. That there is Urtica Urtica. A fucking stinging nettle. It'll come out. A couple of the other notable things at the moment is I've planted the um, 
the blood root, Sangrosorba canadensis. And uh, here I've had to move one because I, I buggered it up really. Uh, this is a Hakuisha, has a little yellow flower very early in the year. I had this lump here planted on top of that. Well, I planted the Artemisia on top of the Thor. That is, uh, yeah, it's a pretty basic and stupid mistake. Too impatient, you see. So there are erythroniums there. We had some erythroniums in pots I was growing on, unknown ones. And this I'll have to caption. Now this, this is quite, quite interesting actually. It's a, it's a beautiful plant and it's Lisa's. Uh, uh, again, I'll have to get the name of it. But it's uh, just going to tumble over the path there. But the idea is to... Um, the path looks a bit stark. You know, it's pea gravel and edging. I want it to be, to be encroached on by the garden, but not to be swallowed up. You know, sometimes you see paths and, and the problem with them is you can't walk down them because they're things are covered in plants or there are weeds or a mess. So the idea here is to um, just let them encroach over but leave a gap down the middle so you can walk, um, walk down there. And you've got room to work. There you are. That's what we've been fannying on with today. Oh, there's a particularly nice Daphne. Unfortunately, it has no scent. That's Daphne Missourium, the normal one. And down there in the garden is Lysocotin skunk cabbage. We're not allowed to grow that anymore because it's uh, you can leave it where it is. Ben, great. Yeah, see our skunk cabbage, Lysocotin. Americana, I think. I'll have to check that out. There's a couple of varieties. Never do I tire of this tree. This is a Sidiphylum japonicum, the Katsura, but this is the weeping form, the pendula. I think I'm probably showing it to you on other videos, but for um, people new to this channel, there's, it's worth having a look at. It is absolutely beautiful. In the autumn, it has the usual smell of candy floss or strawberry jam but the other thing about it is that it really really goes this lovely butter yellow color it is an absolutely incredible tree right so because up here it tends to be quite harsh in the winter things like these Pensamins and similar and like Phygelius, we don't prune them before winter. We could have deadheaded them, but some of these we just shoved them inside and forgot about them. So with these ones now, chance of hard frost is sort of gone. So it is now time for them to get their hard prune and they do get taken really hard back. Because obviously if they just grew from this, they're just gonna end up all up here, all floppy and awful. So what I do, what I'm doing is taking them down pretty much as far as I dare go down to all this nice fresh new growth that is sprouting from the base. Just to try and leave a load of these nice new shoots, clear out any of the horrible like dead leaves from last year. Just leaving these will be some nice, you only, because you only need a handful on them really, you only want a nice handful of nice strong shoots to be flowering this year. I mean, this is a bit of a weaker variety, and you have the white flowered one, Wedding Day. But as you can see, with some of these like stronger ones that are coming away, I have this variety called Flamingo. You can see how all this nice new growth is just going to come away and flower really nice. I can even I'll sniff that off to give it a bit of a tidy up as well. Is that a good handful as well? Yeah. You see all that nice new growth. Is Do you like a good handful, Thomas? I work in handfuls normally. Yeah. It's the quantity I'm very familiar with. Right. A good unit of measurement. Right, and now so when Thomas has 
completed his process, we move them on into larger pots, depending what size they were in originally, but usually they're moved up to a five litre size. This is going to make a massive big clump. And uh, it's, it's actually a very efficient way of buying them. Yeah, sometimes guard designers and that, they say, oh, you must plant things in threes. Well, very often when you have a plant this size, that this is going to be in a couple of months time, you really don't need to. We well, can if you want. I don't think Thomas will mind. No. <laughs> Buy as many as you want. <laughs> but, um, but frankly, if we get an ordinary garden, just one good sized perennial in a five litre mm -hmm. pot like this, it's just fantastic. So, we take his handful, shove it in a pot, stick a few more litres of compost in. And it's, uh, it's, it goes up in price a bit, but it's not, it's surprisingly, it only goes up two or three pounds. And uh, you're gonna get a massive, massive plant. So there you are. And I think this year at Eggleston, they've got all sorts of varieties. Amelia Jane, uh, Laura, Zar, Zar. Firebird. Firebird, Garnet. Kilimanjaro, Vesuvius, Wedding Day, oh, King yeah. George V, Flamingo. Flamingo. I bet that's pretty. Mm -hmm. I inherited these from you, didn't I? Lisa likes the Penstemons, can you tell? <laughs> I know she does. I know she does. You know, a couple of years back, we really hammered this. This is an Osmanthus. Uh, Osmanthus book, Woody Eye, or maybe Del Veo. Um, whichever, they're, they're, they're exactly the same ones, just a bit more compact. And you can see, because we hammered it hard, it's grown up and over. And we've been able to expose the heartwood, the trunk. If we hadn't have done that, it would have just been a complete mass of green. Um, we've been able to accentuate the shape so that it's sort of domed over to one side. And if you stand back from it, you can see how effective that is. Now this, I've been showing you the one at Barningham. This is the, the parent plant. This is uh, Os Viburnum Burkwoodii. And the scent you can smell from 20 yards away. It is beautiful. But as I've explained to you earlier about the one, at, it is prone to aphid. And if, if you, Lisa gets into that quite, you'll see what I mean by the aphid. You really need to keep on top of it in a very, very early stage. Not when it's flowering like this, but, but just early, just a bit before it starts flowering. And over here, we have um, this is Magnolia Sundew. Again, it's kept kept into shape. If it wasn't if it wasn't pruned back, it would be about three times this size. So. Um, Again, don't be afraid to prune them. Prune and restrict, and it will encourage the, the, the flowering. The only problem with it is, is that you do get, if there's any frost or whatever, you can touch them. It's a lovely thing. There's another one over here that comes from New Zealand. It's called Sweet Valentine. And if you look at these blooms, they're, they're single cup-shaped blooms, but they have a, an elegance in the way they just stand and sit on the branches. Yeah, these are some exotic looking fellows. These are Crown Imperials, common name. Fritillaries, Fritillaria Imperialis, I think, yeah. The little snake's head one is um, Fritillary, Fritillaria meliagris. These are, they look like they belong in a seaside, but uh, the, the one thing you notice about them is that some of them smell of weed. These ones don't for some reason, um, but usually they smell of marijuana, pot, cannabis, just weed <laughs> and uh, 
Don't try smoking them because it, it won't work. And trust me, I'm sure when I was younger I would have tried. Heather. <laughs> no, that's a story for another day. Anyway, yeah, crown imperials are very easy. They're just they can grow in semi shade, a little woodlandy garden. They always, to me, they look like they belong on a, a seaside or a, you know, a seaside town or something like that. They are quite dramatic, but I always feel they don't look real, but Lisa loves them. I don't think it's the smell. Well, while the anemone blander have proved uh, nice little drifts of colour, the blue and the pink appeared and disappeared. So whether something chewed them off or what, I don't know. But, having said that, it's still a nice little splash of colour early on. It looks quite natural as well, which I quite like. Uh, there's that, uh, I think that maple is Koto Ichi, Koto Ito Komachi, I think. Yeah, I'd need to check with Matthew about that. But yeah, there is a bit of ground. I think I've been over this that's uh, is going to be reseeded. So I've just stuck some potatoes in it, then some onions, then some shallots because I like posh pickled onions. And then there's some broad beans. And at the front there, I've stuck some uh, rhubarb chard. Did I say rhubarb? Uh, colour, uh, coloured chard, you know, the fancy coloured ones, just to look nice, really. It's a little bit of a veg garden that we're using because it's going to be dug up and probably seeded. Just not sure yet. It's one of those areas we don't know what to do with. I don't know what to do with. I think Lisa would like it down as grass. Which to me seems a waste, but if that's what she wants, I'll do it. But uh, there you are. It's a little bit of vegetable. You don't know, we're all going to starve to death by the end of this year. So a few spuds and a bit of leek and onion and stuff might come in a bit useful. Who knows? I was just toying with these... these um, coloured chards because uh, Lisa's not much into to posh cooking and it's got like too many spices and certainly any herbs you know herby things like uh, she has no she don't like them you're a proper northern girl who likes like stuff to taste like it's meant to without all that like thyme and rosemary oh god rosemary now she won't have that it's funny how people are different. A lot of people, and I can see a point, a lot of people like cooking to taste of herbs. Uh, it does seem a bit odd. There you are, we're all different, aren't we? Starting to fill up now, it's not looking so undressed and naked. The thing was, this was a garden that's meant to be ready by the end of 2024, so it's no comparison to what it's going to look like, but it's coming on nicely. It's looking like it's got some life in it now, rather than the sterile building site that I needed to create to start again. And I can hear bees and birds. Just down the side here, These are uh, camellias for planting out uh, somewhere else later on. This is a very, very nice big one, uh, as big as your hand. Um, it's called uh, Donation. It's been around the years. It's a nice double sort of like um, white one there. I think that's silver anniversary. Haven't got very acid soil here, but. Sometimes they seem to work in a neutral soil, so we'll have to see. The maple, Mikawa Gatsubusa, is really picking up now. It's just a bit windy this morning. Well, I never get tired of looking at that Amalankia in the spring. 
That's one called Ballerina, and you can always tell it's Ballerina because uh, most of the other ones, the leaves come out the same time as the flowers. With Ballerina, the leaves tend to come out afterwards in a lovely sort of salmon pink colour. The spring foliage is, is actually quite, quite beautiful. These here are a lovely crisp white. Now I've got all my old hoster pots, which are probably going to go over to Eggleston, most of them. But a lovely crisp white bell. It is uh, a relative of the Spanish bluebell. It's not related to the English bluebell, which has a much narrower leaf. But um, I just think they're nice. These were already in the garden. I never planted them. If I had, I would probably have put the English bluebell in. I don't know why. You know, these are perfectly good plants. Hey, oh, next door's kids are out. But there's a much smaller one, and there's the blue. This, this little border here will get sorted out eventually. I'm gonna sign off now, because I can't compete with herbits. <laughs> They're very pleasant herbits though. Even though I don't like children. Well, they're all right fried, I suppose. I'm back from my wonderful holiday in America. It was so nice, I did really enjoy it. But I'm back to a very, very beautiful May, a late spring, early summer in England. The blossoms are so lovely, it's everywhere. This is, um, this is an apple blossom, apple arbor. It's absolutely lovely. I'm sitting under it thinking about a poem that I, um, I might have already read it to you, but it's the most lovely poem. It's um, by A. E. Houseman. It's, he's a 19th century English poet and it's called um, Loveliest of Trees, The Cherry Is. Um, and it's from a collection called um, A Shropshire Lad. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride, wearing white for Easter tide. Now of my three score years and ten, twenty will not come again and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since, to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. One thing I did want to mention, actually, without provoking more of the very childish behaviour we got from Malcolm when we talked about beavers before, but when I was in America, I finally did see a beaver. Um, it was on the far shore of the Arkansas River, and I thought it was a beaver, but I couldn't tell straight away. And then a gentleman came along the towpath, and um, it turned out he was a beaver expert, he said, and um, he'd been tracking beaver um, since he was a young man. So he said straight away that it was a beaver. He, he was a bit surprised that it was as inactive as it was. And he also said that you normally didn't see them that early in the evening, but Maybe it was just a good day for beavers, but he definitely identified it. Um, he, he thought it was kind of perhaps a little bit on the shaggy side, but um, maybe a little unwell or just tired. But anyway, I saw it. And so um, as proof that I did see some of these things, I will include um, a photo of my beaver at the end of this. And um, I'm sure Malcolm will put in and then maybe that will be an end to the, to the whole sorry subject. <laughs>
Right, you two. Apparently you've been to the vets recently, haven't you? And one of you is a bit overweight. Do you know which one? Oh, no need to look crestfallen. One of you is a bit overweight, but the other one is very overweight. Is there anything you want to say about that? Would you each still like a biscuit or not? Pepper, you look thoughtful. Finn, you look embarrassed. Yes, I think so. Good choice, Pepper.